very good morning all so our session is uh, all inclusive package for the comprehensive uh, ophthalmologist okay so oh, hopefully this session will be uh, useful for uh, all of us for our day to day practice okay so i'll be starting with the fundus findings for the general ophthalmologist Fundus findings for the general ophthalmologist will be presented by Dr. Samira. Uh, she is consultant vitreo retinal surgeon at Sampatha VR Speciality Center, Tirur, Malapuram. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, fundus findings for the general ophthalmologist. It's a very vast topic. I don't know how am I going to give justice. Uh, by giving an eight minute talk all right so i'll be just brushing with the common things which are going to see in our uh, normal practice so you might be very much aware i think so like uh, this is the story of an elephant with six blind men where everyone perceived differently uh, once they touch the elephant so so is the case with uh, retina like uh, when you perceive what you see is not and the perception is also is entirely different so once you have a structured examination of the retina with the evaluation of the disc, then the posterior pole, and then going to the mid periphery and the periphery, you can at least you can arrive at a conclusion like what it is. So I'll be just brushing with the only the common things what you see. So the disc, the unilateral disc edema, this is the most common thing which we come across. Okay, so the disc edema, like uh, it can be unilateral or bilateral. But the unilateral, you can actually, I mean, differentiate whether it is AAON, as you can see here, which you have a sequential pallor, and you can actually, depending upon the age, you can differentiate, I mean, whether it is a papillitis or AAON. Bilateral disc edema, once you see multiple cotton wool spots and a disc edema, this will be more favoring of malignant hypertension. If it is not there, it can be a raised ICT or a space occupying lesion or a trauma. Bilateral disc edema, the differentials can be bilateral AON, it can be diabetic papillopathy, as you can see the telangiectatic vessels on the disc. Bilateral papillitis is also not so uncommon. Pseudopapillar edema can be seen. So this all can be differentiated with the help of the history, the visual loss, and associated other symptoms, and the signs like color vision and the pupils. Neuroretinitis presents with disc edema with other triad being the optic disc swelling, as I've told, and the visual loss and the macular star. Now, retrobulbar neuritis, the patient sees nothing and the doctor sees nothing, you can go out for the VEP. Now, physiological cupping, as you all know, it is a horizontally oval disc which is respecting the ISIN rule. Once this is not done and when there is an asymmetric cupping of more than 0.2, you can suspect it's a case of glaucoma. Myelinated nerve fibers, uh, don't just brush this off. There are so many systemic and ocular associations associated with. So, you can go ahead and find out like something is there or not. Now, this is an interesting case where you can see in the first uh, picture, it's a case of optic disc coloboma. What about the second one? So that's a six-year-old child who's presenting with history of trauma. So the picture is similar, but that's a case of optic nerve avulsion. Now, pale disc, it's so common these days because of the augmented uh, a dosage of ethambutal toxicity. So even though you don't see the pallor initially, but when you are suspicious, uh, don't hesitate to go for a VEP. This is associated, pale disc is associated with vascular occlusions, nutritional is not that uncommon and trauma is another cause. So this is a very interesting case as you can see over here, it's a 10 year old girl and it's a case of optic disc hypoplasia. Now coming to the posterior pole. So diabetic macular edema, it can be either center involving like what you see over here or it can be a non-center involving edema. So depending upon the edema and depending upon the visual acuity and depending upon the symptoms and signs of the patient, accordingly you can treat it with either with anti of injections or a non-central involving edema, you can observe or you can go for a focal laser. Now, what about this? Hard exudate plaque. Don't just hesitate that the patient is not going to improve. The patient is very much under control with the diabetes. And when you start giving uh, statins, you can see like how beautifully the hard exudate plaques is, are melting. And at the end of one year, the patient has improved from CF2 meter to vision 636. Now, asymptomatic, totally asymptomatic patients like this, when you present, 
So this is a typical case of high risk AMD with confluent multiple drusens. So you should always look for any subtle SRF or IRF. So baseline OCT is needed for such kind of patients. Now geographic atrophy, it's a case of an advanced ARMD. This is with so much of structural loss. Now you see so many conditions like this also with a fibrotic scar, even if the vision is so less, Still, you can actually look for that whether there is so much of SRF or IRF, you can actually treat to salvage the existing vision at least like the, at least the CF, I mean C of 1 meter can improve to 4 to 5 meter as well. Now, the importance of the other eye in such cases are, you can see a very thin grayish membrane if you can visualize. So, you should never miss the other eye of such patients because this is a PCV which is sitting in the good eye. Now, this has been referred from elsewhere as a case of impending CRVO, but in the inferior part, you can see a large uh, subretinal fluid which is sitting over here, and this has ended up with PCV again. Now, myopic CNVM. It's not only the lattice degeneration which you have to look for. Closely, always under high magnification, look for the center of the macula because 5 to 10 percentage of eyes with high myopia can go for a myopic CNVM. You can see the subtle bleeding points, a very small subtle bleeding tinge if you are viewing the patient like every 6 two months to 1 year or a small SRF, always see that myopic CNVM is not missed. Now, this is a typical case of hemorrhagic PED with other hemorrhages and all. So this is a good hemorrhagic PED, but this is a PCV and post ILA injection, the patient has beautifully improved to 6 by 9. Now, sudden loss of vision during dialysis, case of hemi-CRVO, when the visual loss is out of proportion to what you see, see this uh, whitening of the retina. This is actually, it's a combined occlusion. So you can treat this as CRVO, but this should not be missed. Now. Chronic CRVO, you will be seeing it regularly and I'll always look for signs of ischemia. Look for NV and NVD whenever you see the patient on every single visit and looks, look for rule, I mean, NVI and gonioscopy has to be routinely done. Now, you can see the NVD in this case. Now, nasal BRVOs, if at all, these are asymptomatic also. Don't just leave the patient. Keep following up the patient because they can end up with a vitreous hemorrhage later. So, ischemia has to be looked out. Now, cherry red spot, cherry trees never grow tall in sand and mud. So as you all know, this norms. And uh, this is another patient. You can see the whiteness over there at the posterior pole. Don't just think that it is just a fibrotic scar. Basically, it is a small retinal artery occlusion sitting over there. So the visual was totally uh, uh, disproportionate to what you see over there. CSR, mostly it is like the blurring or distortion. Mostly we tend to miss at the initial stages and all. So, but in elderly, when you see such cases and all, rule out under uh, underlying neovascular causes. Now, this was referred as a case of a CSR, but this turned out to be serous PED. Now, full thickness macular hole, uh, this can be, uh, I mean, uh, correlated with either it's a macular pucker or a lamellar hole. So, lamellar holes, you can actually, you can wait, but full thickness macular hole, always you have to refer for a VR surgeon. Now, Stargardt's disease, in the due course of time, you can see this has ruptured and finally it has ended up with a scar. Retinitis pigmentosa can be sectoral or the full-blown retinitis uh, pigmentosa. You have to correct the refractory error to the maximum and the central part of the patient is having a visual loss. Look for cataract, ERM or cystoid macular edema which can be treated at the correct point of time so that the existing vision can be salvaged. Juxtafovial steel and TJCM, most of the time this has been missed in our day-to-day -day practice. So such cases when the vision is not proportional to what you see, always look for the high magnification time. You go for their blended right angle venules or superficial retinal crystals is there or not. Toxoplasmosis, you can see fresh cases like this with vasculitis or it can be seen adjacent to a scar. Whenever you see a macular toxoplasmosis, it is always better to go with intravital clindamycin. It works wonders more than rather than giving the oral antitoxoplasmic agents. So this can be associated with a secondary CNVM later. Sarcoidosis can be associated with anterior viatus. You can see snowballs, vasculitis, choroidal nodules also can be seen, so treat accordingly. Blunt trauma, even if you see the blunt trauma patients and all, please follow up these patients. You can see the different uh, types of traumatic maculopathy, choroidal rupture and all, and uh, this has to be documented also in our current scenario, just this can go for litigations later. Now, white dwarf symptoms, it's not that so uncommon. Now, peripheral retinal degenerations like lattice degeneration, this is uh, actually 
it's a garret atrophy but you can see the cobblestone which is in the center picture and snail tracks also and operculated hole the holes has to be treated as soon as possible but lattice with suspicious hole always you can uh, uh, go for a regular checkup thank you so this is in a nutshell thank you Our next speaker is Dr. Akshay. Okay, he's a well-renowned oculoplastic surgeon from Agarwal Sai Hospital, Mumbai. He has many awards both at national and international levels to his credit. He's executive council member at National Oculoplastic Association at Asia Pacific Academy. Okay, over to you, Dr. Akshay. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, I'll be talking about what the, the, the whole concept of periocular aesthetics from the perspective of a comprehensive ophthalmologist and who, you know, who has his or own standalone setup with multiple specialists visiting or things of that sort. So when we talk about aesthetic procedures that typically an oculoplastic surgeon or a comprehensive ophthalmology looks at, it includes ptosis. Patients oftentimes come to us with complaints of under eye hollows or under eye dark circles and we often tell them, oh, this is just a lack of sleep or you've been sitting in the AC for too long and just send them off. But we now have very, very targeted techniques of correcting them. Also, we can look at, we'll be looking at how botulinum toxin can help in improving the aesthetic appearance of patients, especially in the area around the eye, under eye bags or upper lid hooding, and how we can actually promote aesthetic procedures and aesthetic uh, consults in our clinic. So most of us focus on the patient's complaints, but a, a significant proportion of oculoplastic procedures arise from the doctor's observations. So a patient may come with, say, blurred vision or not being able to read uh, uh, distant things clearly, and you may notice a mild ptosis. Now it's important that we need to tell them, have you noticed that this eye is actually smaller? Have a look at it, look at photos that you've gotten clicked and you'll probably look and then they go back and then they'll come back to you in some time and say, yeah, I think I've noticed my eyes a little small, what can be done for you? So it's Im important that we also actively counsel them and we have, you know, we can speak to our oculoplasty colleagues and ask for them to share some before and after photos of say a blepharoplasty or a ptosis surgery that we can actually show to the patient because before and after pics are a real game changer. When they see a patient who's had a similar procedure done for a condition that they have and has improved, that really makes a difference because going undergoing a surgery can be a very uh, a, a large rate limiting step. So ptosis often missed, especially when you know we, we have patients who wear minus six, minus seven, high minus glasses come in for LASIK. Uh, so from LBP, they actually published a study where every patient undergoing LASIK were asked to remove their glasses and they had the photography department click photos in all gazes. 6% of these patients had mild or moderate severe of which half of them opted to undergo ptosis surgery after the, cat the LASIK surgery. So by the simple procedure of having them click a photograph so they know how they look like after the refractive surgery and for them to pick up some minor asymmetries or ptosis is very important. Even after cataract surgery, you, you oftentimes see and then we reassure them and send them back, but we actually need to actively counsel them to get them to operate these cases. Uh, now, the other thing that we oftentimes get is under eye dark circles or under eye hollows or pigmentation and we ask what can be done. So there are different reasons why this happens. There is certainly some periocular pigmentation which is hereditary and can be caused by certain drugs as well. And there's something known as tear trough hollow. Now tear trough hollow is this deformity that we see or this area of hollowness that extends from the area inferolaterally from the medial canthus to approximately the mid pupillary line and becomes progressively more prominent with aging. And that is actually a, a cutaneous groove along the bone, the anterior lacrimal crest. 
And how do we treat that? We use a filler injection. Now this is exactly hyaluronic acid, the same kind that is used in viscoelastics, but of course it's a higher molecular weight which is uh, cross-linked. And these are different fillers that are available for use in different parts of the face. So what do we do in these cases is that we anesthetize the area with topical uh, uh, prelox gel. And on the pre-periosteal plane is where we inject small aliquot. So it's much like how you have two tiles in the bathroom and there is a small groove between the two tiles and you put in a little bit of cement to flatten out the whole thing. That's exactly what is being done. This is called a tear filler. It's a simple procedure that can be done in the OPD. As you can see, you're, as long as you're away from major neurovascular bundles, it has a very good effect. And this is immediately post-procedure. You can see the difference. So patients who actually come to you with under eye hollows or under eye pigmentation, they have a solution, whether it is something as subtle, very subtle, or a little moderate, or something very severe like this. Now here, we are able to treat the hollowing with the filler injections but the pigmentation persists. Now for this pigmentation, you can actually send the patient to a dermatologist who can do carbon dioxide lasers. Every dermatologist has a carbon dioxide laser. It is their FACO machine. It is their bread and butter. So don't be afraid to refer to a dermatologist. Over time, they will begin referring patients back to you. Even men, it's not that these procedures are only for women. This is a gentleman who's getting married, said my eyes look, I look always like as if patient, people ask me, have I drunk in the morning? And all they had was a peri under, under eye hollows, which needs to be filled with filler. And uh, it, 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 it again improves very well. So this is a patient who underwent filler and one session of carbon dioxide laser. And you can see that the hollowing is improved, but pigmentation needs, it takes a little time to go. Again, pigmentation is, uh, hollowing is improved and pigmentation is also improved. So fillers are actually are used in all over the face, uh, but I think in, in terms of starting off practice, under eye area is a very good place to offer. Next, I'll talk a little bit of Botox. Botox is an injectable medication. We use it in squint, in oculoplastics, in a lot of other specialties, neurology, urology. It is a reversible uh, medication which acts locally by paralyzing the muscles. How does paralyzing muscle help? So there are creases and folds that we have on our face. Now this is a patient who is looking normal on the left. Now you ask her to raise her eyebrows, she lifts her eyebrows, the frontalis contracts and you get these creases or muscle lines. This is a static crease, a, a dynamic crease, sorry. The moment the muscle is in movement, it creates a dynamic crease. Over time, repeated use of the same muscle, uh, the muscle contracting, the furrows being created, a dynamic crease will go up and becoming a static crease. So by injecting muscle in the uh, in Botox into the muscle in the frontalis, we prevent the dynamic crease from appearing, but don't inhibit the action of the muscle. So the muscle will contract, but the folds or the creases will not be seen. As compared to this, now this is a patient who's having a, no expression on her face, but still she's got all the creases and these are static creases. Once a static crease has developed, you can inject a liter of Botox, nothing is going to happen. So you can delay these signs of aging from occurring by periodically getting Botox done to prevent the dynamic creases from becoming a static crease. So it usually takes three to four days to kick in. The peak effect is seen between two to three weeks and it lasts for about four months. Botulinum toxin does not last for four months. Patients may come and tell you, we have certain spasm patients that, oh, last time the injection you gave me worked for six, eight months. Well, that works on their mind and not actually on their eyeballs. So where do we inject? We can inject on the glabellar line, the frown lines, crow's feet, I'll show you. So this is in, in, the, in the case of frown lines. So what, what we're doing is asking the patient to frown. And you can see when she's frowning, these wrinkles appear. These are called the leaven lines because they are like one and one leaven. This, is, this muscle is a corrugator muscle. That is the one which is contracting and creating that line. So we inject in that. This is the procerus muscle that brings the eyebrow down. So that's where we injecting. So by injecting in the procerus, the corrugators, we are taking away the 11 lines, the frown lines. And then we inject onto the frontalis muscle. And when we inject onto the frontalis muscle, we keep a gap of one centimeter above the eyebrow, which is a no injection zone. At least one in centimeter is the space and then we inject at multiple spots. The effect of this, this is a patient frowning. You can see the 11 lines, the same patient frowning, but the 11 lines or the eyebrow frown lines are not seen. 
here when she's raising her eyebrow the frowns are the the furrows are visible again here she's raising the eyebrow after the injection the furrows have gone away uh, similarly for crow's feet when people smile sometimes they get very very prominent creases at the lateral canthus those are called crow's feet because if you see crow's feet they are like four or five lines going from a single point so it's like the paw of a crow again injecting four or five units of botox in that corner works very well so especially when they smile the, these lines that are seen at this corner they all go away and again this is before and after again before and after the uh, crow's feet work very well they work for three months and uh, three to four months and these are all OPD procedures. You don't need to go to the OPD, uh, OT for this. Here, by injecting just under the eyebrow in this orbicularis, we are able to create an eyebrow lift so that patients can have a gentle temporal lift in the eyebrow. We can also do, in a lot of patients, when they smile, their eyes become a little small because there's a small bump or muscle that uh, 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 of tissue that accumulates there. That's because when we smile, this orbicularis it gets pushed up because the zygomaticus and all our facial muscles move upward when we smile. Orbicularis contracts and there's this small belly of orbicularis that occurs, is seen under the eyelid. Injecting small five units of Botox over there, exactly in this, the pre-tarsal orbicularis works very well. So these patients go from having this jelly roll under the eye to not having that and that completely changes the appearance of the face. A lot of patients get conscious when they smile, they say their eyes become small. Finally, I'll come to under eye bags. Now, when patients like this come to us and tell us that I can't see well, like Arjuna who saw the eye of the fish in the well, we can only see the NS2, NS3 in that eye and we miss the under eye sagging, the uh, upper eyelid hooding. So, these are patients who have fat prolapse. Uh, I'll just take one minute more. So this occurs even in younger patients and the way to confirm that it is fat and nothing else is you ask the patient to look up. When the patient look up, looks up, the orbital septum relaxes and the fat bulges forward. So it worsens on up gaze. And when they look down, the septum tightens, the inferior rectus pulls it back. The fat improves appearance on down gaze. The same thing is seen even in older patients, but in older patients you will see they will have some inferior scleral show and excess skin, so they may need skin tightening procedure as well. So these are cases that you can always offer to refer to your oculoplastic colleague, patients who undergone transconjunctival blepharoplasty. It's done from the inner aspect of the eyelid through the uh, root just under the tarsal border. We excise fat, we transpose fat under the periosteum. Uh, all oculoplastic surgeons are very familiar with this route. So when you have patients who come for this, don't prescribe refreshed tears and tell them to come after three months. Send them to your oculoplastic surgeon or ask them to come over and it will really help. Again, patients who come saying their eyes look tired with a conjunctival transconjunctival or transcutaneous blepharoplasty, uh, they can work really well. This is, uh, this, well, this is my mother-in-law and she's very happy with the surgery. Uh, this is again another patient who had excessive skin hooding. So you, know, you can't even see the upper lid margin and with that you're able to treat that. Some patients may even have lacrimal gland prolapse so you're able to treat that with a blepharoplasty and a lacrimal gland reposition. Again, patient came for cataract consultation. My colleague was kind enough to look behind the fish eye and say that you know you should get your eye also looked and patient was actually motivated enough. Look how many years we've knocked off his face, at least 10, 15 years. And he was so happy that he says, now I actually am able to see more because the vision, field of vision has improved. Again, the same thing for this. This is a quad bluff, both upper, both lower. You know, it knocks off at least 10, 12 years of their face. Patients who come to us like this, we say, oh, you have cholesterol. Look at this cholesterol that has occurred. Well, that cholesterol, xanthalesma, can be excised. Agreed, there are recurrence rates. There is no mode of treatment with xanthalesma that does not have recurrence rates. Uh, also, incidentally, one, only one third of patients with cutaneous xanthalasma have hypercholesterolemia and one third of the patients above the age of 40 also have hypercholesterolemia. Hypercholesterolemia has no correlation with xanthalasma. So save the patient that blood test by not asking them to do a cholesterol level because most often than not, it's going to be normal. They, at least they are happy that their concerns are addressed. Small lids, little bumps, warts, uh, papillomas, 
uh, they may not make a difference. So patient really didn't have a complaint about these things. But if you're able to improve the quality of life by imp improving their aesthetic outcome, that is something we should offer the patients. I'll finish off. Chemical peels are a little advanced, which most dermatologists do. Uh, so to summarize, aesthetic procedures go hand in hand with core ophthalmology. Ocular aesthetics and periocular aesthetics is as much as ophthalmology as multifocal and trifocal lenses. Active counseling and generating counts, consults for your oculoplastic surgeon, offering a patient a free consult with an oculoplastic surgeon, telling them that for the next few months we'll send patients, don't charge them, we'll consult with them. Over time they will convert to surgeries. Show them before and after pics because that is the main game changer. Uh, you can have screens in your waiting room with patients with mild ptosis before and after, blepharoplasty before and after. I call that waiting room passive promotion. Automatically they know that this is also done here and slowly by word of mouth it will improve. And if you really want to expand your practice and do these procedures yourself, there are multiple courses that offer new skill acquisition for general ophthalmologists. I'll be happy to share details of this offline. Thank you so much for your time and for the invitation. Questions at the end, you can take. Uh, okay. uh, thank you, Dr. Rakshay. That was a very wonderful presentation. Next, we have Dr. Vinita. She's currently working as a VR consultant at Abate Eye Hospital, Perantalmanna. Over to you, Dr. Vinita. Good morning, all of you. Uh, I'll be presenting on the basics of OCT for a comprehensive ophthalmologist. Now, why we need to understand OCT? Because it is one of the most common investigations ordered in ophthalmology. Uh, because it is a non-contact, non-invasive imaging modality, which gives high resolution cross-sectional images equivalent to an optical biopsy. Now, in order to get the maximum out of an OCT, we should be aware of the scanning protocols that are available. The most common we have is the macular cube. In macular cube, what you have uh, are multiple B scans passing through the macula that is in the first picture. And uh, in addition to the horizontal and the vertical line scans along the macula, you also have the option to take radial scans. That is, uh, radial scans spanning the fovea or any other particular area of interest. This will give you a high resolution images of that particular area. Now, the third picture you can see there are five lines. So, this is a high resolution raster line scan. The importance of this scan is that when you have a focal pathology which you want to see in greater detail, you can run these five lines. These are high resolution scans, but you will be able to image only a particular small area. Now coming to the normal OCT, I've already said it is an optical biopsy. So it is actually a replica of the histological section of the retina. Uh, you have the optically clear vitreous uh, in the top part of the image. And the easy way to see these hypo, hyper alternating bands is, uh, you can remember that nerve fiber layers and plexiform layers are usually hyper reflective, whereas nuclear layers are hypo reflective. So this gives that uh, alternating hypo, hyper pattern of the inner retina. Now the outer retina, you can see uh, four lines. They're otherwise called zones. And this area, you need to see a little more closely because uh, with the current high resolution OCTs, we can now image these outer retinal zones in great detail. So the first is the external limiting membrane. It is a faint line, uh, the topmost line of the outer four zones. Then you have the ellipsoid zone. This is a particularly important area because as you can see the down picture, it is a microscopic structure of the photoreceptors. So in the outer part of the photoreceptors, there is an area which, is, which has got high density of mitochondria. The ellipsoid zone actually corresponds to this area of high mitochondrial density. The importance is that when the photoreceptors lose their viability, the mitochondrial count is the first to come down. So this actually gives an indication of the functional capacity of the retina. Beneath that, you have the interdigitation zone. There are various current names for it. And beneath that, you have the RP Brooks membrane complex. Now, a look at the fovea. We all know fovea is normally a depression, but in certain pathological conditions, we may not be able to identify the fovea just by looking at the depression. 
So other ways you can identify the fovea in an OCT scan is one you can see the convergence of the inner layers that is the hypo hyper bands will converge at the fovea and another thing is that cones are slightly taller at the fovea. So the external limiting membrane will show an anterior bowing just immediately below the fovea. Now some case scenarios, so this is a patient with uh, clinical macular Mac, uh, diabetic maculopathy. Now when you take the OCT scan, the gross finding you can see is uh, within the inner plexiform and nuclear layers, there are hyporeflective round spaces corresponding to cysts and you can see some hyperreflective hyper material corresponding to the hard exudates and beneath the hard exudates you can see that black shadowing that is any hyperreflective structure in the retina will lead to shadowing this is not actually loss of tissue but shadowing another thing that you have to uh, note in this OCT is if you can look at the outer retinal zones in spite of the massive edema you can see that the outer retinal zones are relatively intact so what you can understand is that this is a patient who is likely to have a good visual out outcome following treatment as opposed to the previous image here you can see there are large cystoid spaces uh, predominantly vertically oval cysts. Now the importance of vertically oval cysts is that it indicates chronicity. When the cysts become chronic, they become vertically oval. You can see a hyperreflective membrane on the surface of the retina. It is a uh, epiretinal membrane. And if you can see the outer retinal zones, you can see that the lines corresponding to the ellipsoid zone and the external limiting membrane, they're pra practically absent. So this is a candidate where you have to explain guarded visual prognosis even with treatment. Now one of the new things that has come up in diabetic retinopathy is DIL, otherwise known as disorganization of retinal inner layers. So we've already discussed that it has got a band, the uh, retina has got a banded pattern of alternating hypo and hyperreflective layers. This is a condition where there is disorganization of tissues and you can see in the foveal area there is a disorganization of the uh, banded structure. So this is uh, considered as a bad prognostic sign in diabetic macular edema. Now we often tend to look at these uh, two pictures that is the thickness. This is a color coded thickness map and in the center you can see the quantitative uh, thickening of the retina. This is good for patient education and quantitative analysis, but it cannot be used reliably for diagnosis. The reason is that thickness maps are often subjected to segmentation errors. And you can see in the B scan of the OCT, this is not just an edema, but there is a vitreoretinal hyperreflect interface membrane, uh, which is pulling the fovea upward. So that is a surgical indication, which you know, may not be able to pick up with a thickness map or a color coded map. Again, BR view is another case where uh, the edema appears similar to diabetic macular edema. But in contrast to venous occlusions, in arterial occlusions, if you can see at the first, say the first image, there is hyperreflectivity of the inner retinal layers. This is because this is in the acute stage and this is because of cytotoxic edema. But eventually you can see in the lower image, it proceeds to atrophy of the retinal layers. Now another patient where you have an indication for OCT. Now the typical feature of uh, ARMD is drusens. Typically drusens are hyperreflective deposits beneath the RP. Benign drusens are characterized by the fact that the RP overlying the drusen will be intact and typically there will not be any intraretinal or subretinal fluid. Now a fate of a drusen it can go into geographic atrophy or a CNVM. So this is the drusen which is undergoing geographic atrophy. Initially you can see there are some hyper reflective lines beneath the RP in the PED, the first picture. That is because of gradual RP atrophy which is causing light to pass through the RP. Later on the PED collapses and in the final picture you can see there is complete atrophy of the outer retinal layers as a result of which the choroid appears very hyper reflective. That is because the hyper reflective RP is uh, undergoing uh, atrophy. I am not going into the classification of CNVM based on OCT, but some of the findings that you can appreciate in OCT for a CNVM are one is the hyperreflective membrane beneath the irregular RP elevation. Then you can see subretinal fluid. Uh, you have uh, intraretinal cysts also. The presence of intraretinal cysts and subretinal fluid is highly suggestive of activity in a case of CNVM. Now CNVM is one case where you have to routinely follow up the patient. So being an invasive tool, OCT is a very uh, good uh, adjunct in your management. Now in the first picture, you can see the CNVM with subretinal fluid 
minimal intraretinal edema and with treatment you can see the size of the PED as well as the subretinal fluid is coming down. Later on during follow up the patient has developed a recurrence. So the top third, the, the below third image you can see uh, there is subretinal fluid which indicates recurrence of CNVM. Now this is again a picture we are all common with, uh, uh, commonly seeing that is uh, neurosensory detachment CSR. But CSR, you, it is one place where you have to run through all the B scans in the macula because you can have associated findings like PED, subretinal fibril. And there are certain conditions which may look like CSR, but they are not actually CSR. For example, the first case, you can see under the subretinal fluid, you have a lumpy elevation of the choroid. It's actually a case of VKH. In the second one, it's not a foveal scan. The foveal scan looks like CSR. But if you run through the multiple B scans, you can see there is irregular RP elevation. It's actually a case of CNVM. The third case is one picture which may look like CSR, but this is actually a case of adult vitelliform dystrophy with resorption of the vitelliform deposits. Again, a PED, but there are some uh, PEDs which should, you should be cautious about. That is, one is a hemorrhagic PED. Then you can see thumb-like PEDs. That is the first image. Uh, then in the middle, between the two PEDs, you can see a, a break in the RP that is called a double layer sign. Then you can have notched PEDs. These are a few spotters, I'll just run through it. So here you can see there is a membrane causing a distortion of the fovea, it's a VMT. This is a full thickness macular hole where a raster line becomes very useful. This is again a partial defect, there is an ERM on top. But you here also you can see the outer retinal layers are intact. So also although the OCT has a very gross abnormality, the patient will actually have good vision. Again, this is a spotter. ILM draping sign. Here the cysts are not actually fluid, but they are degenerative cysts and this is MACTEL. Now you should be aware of the artifacts to know that it is not pathological. These are the newer domains, angio, intraoperative, adaptive and wide angle OCT. Now a few take home messages. Uh, first is always analyze B scans across the macula, multiple B scans across the macula and not just a single image because in order to identify pathologies you have to do multiple scans. Then always examine the outer retinal zones because it is very much indicative of the functional outcome. Then do not rely on thickness maps alone, always look at the B scans and correlate it with the thickness. Use the appropriate scanning protocols to get maximum information like you can use five line raster scans to get detailed uh, analysis of certain areas. Most important of all is always have a look at the fundus or see the fundus photograph because you always have to correlate the OCT clinically. Thank you so much. Thank you Dr. Vinita. Next we have Dr. Kavita. She is a well-renowned pediatric ophthalmologist. Uh, uh, she is the editor of the Karnataka Ophthalmic Society as well. So over to you Dr. Kavita. I would like to thank uh, KSOC Yes, and Dr. Samira and Dr. Srini for this uh, opportunity. Yes. I have no financial interest in this presentation. As all of us know that uh, visual equity improves rapidly during the first year of life and goes on developing and matures by the age of approximately five to six years. Neonates are normally hypermetropic. They have an a uh, diopter of uh, plus power of about four diopters and uh, with a minimal lasting matrism of two diopters. So anything like between two and three shouldn't be uh, really jumping and prescribing glasses or get panicked about it. With increasing age, hypermetropia and astigmatism do decrease gradually. Emetropization is completed by seven to eight years of age. The correction of emetropia in children is quite challenging because of the low cooperation that we get from these children and there's a risk of amblyopia and role uh, reliability is an important factor and uh, most importantly is the convincing the parents to under make them understand that the child has refractive error and it needs uh, glasses. And prescribing visual correction for children has two goals, that, that is to provide a focused retinal image and achieve an optimal balance between accommodation and convergence. This is quite essential and uh, important to establish as early as possible. What are the indications for refraction? Either the parents uh, come with uh, the complaint that the child is not able to see or as an abnormal gaze or abnormal head posture or abnormal looking eyes and uh, sometimes parents do p pick up the presence of squint and nystagmus is quite obvious. So all these indications or conditions present at 
uh, younger children uh, is an indication for refraction. Uh, just briefly on the types of pediatric refraction is uh, first is the objective and the second one is subjective. Subjective is little difficult in children less than uh, five years. Sometimes uh, children do cooperate uh, between four and five years. It's worth trying, the putting in effort and trying. We have to look at the keratometry reading. Uh, you can possibly do a ARK and uh, retinoscopy proper has the dynamic retinoscopy and static uh, retinoscopy. Dynamic is uh, actually nothing but the near retinoscopy where we actually assess the amount of accommodation that is there. And static, either you do dry and most of the time it is the cycloplegic uh, retinoscopy that we have to consider in children. In some young patients, subjective refraction may be impossible. So hence, uh, a cycloplegic refraction and retinoscopy is a gold standard uh, procedure. Now let us look at the various cycloplegics that we have to consider in children. Uh, the first is atropin and we know it has uh, longest uh, duration of action and the onset of action is also pretty late. It takes about 36 hours and invariably with squint we use this uh, ointment uh, three times a day for three days and then we refract later. The other alternative to atropin is the home atropin which uh, the effect of course starts off by one hour but uh, with the squint I, I once again uh, use it for three days and three times uh, for both eyes. And duration of the effects uh, last for about three to four uh, days. And cyclopentylate is for older children. The duration of uh, onset of uh, duration is like uh, two, two days, two to three days. Anyway, if you want to do a post-mediatic test, better to do after three days. And the other drug is the tropicamide, which you can use it in older days. Here we need to understand what we have to deduct is for the distance. It's about uh, 1 to 1.5 di diopters. If you are uh, doing refraction at 1 meter, then you deduct it by 1 uh, diopter. If it's little lesser than that, you can uh, uh, deduct it by 1.5 diopters. Then you need to also deduct for the cycloplegic drug that you are using. For atropin, it's about 1, one to 1 1.5 diopters. And uh, for the others, you can have an average of 0.5 to 0.75 diopters. AO has these guidelines, uh, rough guidelines. So uh, uh, which one to use in what age? And the other thing that you have to consider is whether the child is as having associated squint, that is esotropia. So less than two years, all children, uh, you use uh, with or without esotropia, atropin 1%. And uh, between two to five years, uh, you can shift to cyclopentylate if there's no esotropia, but with esotropia better to uh, uh, do a atropin refraction. Between five to eight years, it's once again uh, cyclopentylate with esotropia or you can shift to tropicamide. And uh, with or without, uh, I, I mean, wherever there is squint, better to go for cyclopentylate or uh, atropin or uh, homoatropin. But otherwise, you can shift to tropicamide for uh, children above eight years. There are various uh, charts uh, to assess the visual acuity. I'm not going in detail regarding this, but above three years, we can try the Snellen charts, HO, HOTV chart, Tumblingi, and uh, Logmar chart. For children less than three years who are not cooperative for refraction, you can think of an OPD procedure that is sedation under oral uh, syrup. Pedichloral syrup is what I use, and it's half the dose uh, uh, the weight, first you measure the weight of the child and then half the weight you can give that uh, syrup. Or if really uncooperative children, you can think of uh, examination under short general anesthesia. And uh, less than uh, five to six months, I do think of uh, ROP drops, which is a diluted tropicamide plus. A streak retinoscopy and the lens stack is very convenient because all these lenses are in one uh, row and you can uh, sequentially just jump from one lens instead of changing the lenses, you know, which is there in the trial set. A portable ARK is very useful in understanding what is the uh, post-cycloplegic uh, refraction. These are the various uh, portable ARs available in the market. I have no financial interest. I usually use the NIDAC and the Aurolab AR. They, give, uh, they do give uh, uh, reliable results, but frequently we need to calibrate this with the company people so that we get the same readings over a period of time. When to prescribe the glasses, yeah, we do follow AO guidelines, but later eventually you start having your own uh, 
you know, sense of discretion when to give and how much to give. And also, if possible, wherever subjective refraction uh, comes into play, I think the age is an important factor. Above five years, most children do, uh, you know, allow for subjective correction. Correction, only thing that we need is patience. So coming to myopia, infants and toddlers with myopia of greater than four diopters, you think of it, and aim to prescribe the lowest finest power that need uh, required for best visual acuity. Hypermetropia, uh, greater than five diopter, can result in asthenopia, and uh, full cycloplegic correction is given in children with esotropia. And uh, bifocals have to be given for children with esotropia with high AC by A ratio. So this near ad which is given takes care of the near deviation. Now coming to astigmatism, uh, as earlier we were uh, under correcting, it's no more required. You can give full cylindrical correction. Can we conclude and, uh, faster, madam? Yeah. yeah. Anisometropia, any power greater than a uh, difference of 1.5 diopters, you can think of uh, prescribing. This is the AO guidelines uh, for uh, isometropia, any for myopia, anything above three, hyperopia, anything above four, and uh, astigmatism, anything greater than two, you can think of prescribing. Needless to say, duochrome test has to be done. Check on the cylinder, and most importantly, binocular bla balancing is important. In a fake X, additionally, for uh, less than children, uh, children less than two years or three years, you think of additional add of plus two. And about three years, you can think of bifocals. Pseudomyopia is uh, yet another condition where you have myopia before uh, refraction, cycloplegic refraction, but post cycloplegia, there is a hypermetropic shift. So you'll have to look for the factors that is really causing the pseudomyopia. Spectacles have to be well fitted, comfortable, well centered, and should not hamper the natural development of the nose. This care has to be taken while prescribing the glasses. Now coming to the last slide, the do's is age appropriate vision charts have to be considered. Appropriate cycloplegic age agent has to be used. PMT has to be done whenever required. Full cycloplegic correction for hyperopia with uh, esotropia. Full correction for hyperopia, myopia and astigmatism. And children with cylinder greater than two diopters, think of topography and pachymetry uh, to rule out keratoconus. A regular follow up is mandatory. Don't undercorrect in myopia and astigmatism. When in doubt about refraction, don't prescribe glasses. It's better to do PMT. Watch out on pseudomyopia and over or undersized or tight frames and decentered glasses. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kavita. Uh, for the next two speakers, actually, we are running short of time like anything. So I welcome Dr. Lucy. She'll be presenting on uh, amblyopia. Okay, she is uh, working at Putlatai Hospital, Kodikod. Okay, coming to, uh, uh, th uh, first I would like to thank Kaisers for giving me this opportunity. Coming to amblyopia, uh, as you all know the definition, this is a de decrease in the visual acuity for which no causes can be detected by physical examination. And uh, according to AO, there, if there is a difference of two uh, line difference between the two eyes, or if the visual acuity is less than 20, 30, it's considered amblyopia. And these are the various uh, causes based on the etiology. Why is it necessary to treat? Because it's psychologically distressing. It doubles the risk of the when the other eye is uh, uh, when the other eye loses vision. Uh, it, uh, uh, treatment improves the quality of life, and in certain carriers, a six six vision and good stereopsis is required. Visual acuity uh, recording is the first step in amblyopia treatment. We uh, we have different charts depending on the age of the child. And uh, we have to have a crowding vision recorded because the other charts tend to overestimate vision. And we have to have a thorough examination of the anterior segment and posterior segment to rule out the uh, the organic causes of amblyopia. The aim of our treatment is that the right eye, the uh, both eye vision becomes equal, and the treatment is said to be successful when the when the difference between the two eyes is within one line. And it is ma mainly based on first step is the optical correction, and the next uh, step is to make use of the amblyopic eye. Most of the treatment guidelines are these are the various options, and most of the treatment guidelines are based on the pedic uh, pedic group study. And uh, coming to the first step, that is the optical correction. 
It is the initial step in care of children 0 to 17 years of age with amblyopia and a good percentage of children with anisometropic and am amotropic strabismic uh, amblyopia improves. There is at least a two-line improvement in these cases. And we have to do a full uh, uh, cycloplegic refraction and in high prof full hypropic correction have to be given. In the in when after prescription, the, the visual acuity improvement occurs uh, during the, there will be a steep increase in the in, uh, visual acuity during the 4 to 12 weeks, after which there is a plateau phase and then it gradually, uh, very slowly improves. I'll uh, come to the case later. Now about the next mode of treatment, that is occlusion therapy. Uh, here we uh, prefer self-adhesive patches th than the cloth patches because uh, young children uh, tend to peek over the, this patch. And the next question when you uh, think about occlusion therapy, which comes to your mind is uh, how much to patch. In, in, uh, in studies, severe amblyopia, six hours patching has shown similar results as full-time patching. And in case of moderate amblyopia, two hours patching has similar results as uh, six hours patching and in if in uh, if after two hours of patching there is no improvement in the visual acuity increased time and you have all you have to consider patching if in older children if they've never undergone patching if not and they are not, uh, not very regular with that treatment also you have to encourage near activities of one hour and uh, whether to start patching and give glasses at the same time or to uh, uh, wait for some time and then give uh, start patching is uh, still uh, not very the same and in for young uh, younger children it's always better to start sequential because uh, it is to reduce the load of the patching therapy and when to stop when the visual acuity in both eyes becomes equal or in case of strabismic amblyopia when the fixation becomes becomes fully alternating or there is no improvement despite three to six months of patching and when you uh, stop patching gradual tapering should be done then uh, stopping abruptly coming this uh, this is a very ideal case which comes to a op this is a five year old uh, with a de uh, defective vision de detected in school screening right eye vision 66 six, six, uh, left eye vision 636 six, best corrected visual equity 618 no anterior segment or posterior segment pathologies. Uh, she was uh, prescribed glasses, the same power, and after two months, uh, the child comes back with vision uh, left eye improving to 612, and she was ag again advised to continue patching for the ag again to uh, after two. Sh she was ad uh, advised patching two hours, and she was advised to come after two months. And how now her vision is crowding vision is 69. She was advised uh, to continue, and she comes back after three months with. 66 vision and then she was again reviewed to rule out recurrence and uh, it was it confirmed 66 vision and then she was uh, sh uh, reviewed every six monthly and um, now uh, coming to the next mode that is atropine penalization it is say, a similar treatment effect as patching daily atropine administration is not necessary a twice per week schedule is also effective it is appropriate for both first line treatment and for patching failure and various drugs are available in uh, in our market which has been tried for amblyopia it's calling be the most common one it has neuroprotective effects and the other drugs are fluoxetine and donepozil which is still in un under investigation and though some pharmacological treatment options are, and in particular citicoline have been tried, but still long-term studied are needed in future. And uh, coming to the various new, newer methods, this is liquid crystal glasses, which provides intermittent occlusion which al and alternate one lens between the opaque and the transparent lens. Uh, and Dr. Lucy, can you just conclude? We have one more speaker actually uh, this session is up. And next method is the perpetual learning. Uh, um, Methods based on perpetual learning that we have the revital vision therapy. Here the GABA patches, are, it's a software based, but GABA patches have been used to stimulate the uh, occipital cortex. And uh, the next common therapy is the dicoptic training. This is a true binocular treatment where you can uh, improve the stereopsis also. Here we reduce the fellow eye contrast to balance the, uh, between, uh, to, con uh, to rebalance the contrast between the two eyes. Various games are available based on the dicoptic therapy, which uh, and the one we use is the binox therapy. And video games can also be used for patching dicoptic uh, treatment and to also to develop stereopsis. This is another mode of uh, treatment that is transcranial transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation, which results in temporary ne neural excitability. 
and the autoptic uh, magnocellular stimulator. Here, uh, way, uh, multiple areas in brain are stimulated, which in turn stimulates a visual uh, vision center. It's uh, found to be effective in anisometropic and strabismic amblyopia. And not to forget about the artificial intelligence weights chaosite. And follow up is very important. It's usually done at, uh, in amblyopia, it's usually done at six to eight weeks after giving glasses. Then you have to initiate therapy. And again, after uh, eight weeks, we have to see, uh, check for the, if there is uh, no vision improve, improvement, we have to check compliance and then increase, pa uh, then increase patching time or change mode. If better, you have to continue the same treatment. Okay, I think I'll skip the cases. No, 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 skip the Thank you. Dr. Jayashree, she will be talking on what's new in glaucoma. Dr. Jayashree, we have just five minutes and all. Oh, I'll try to conclude within that okay, then. Yeah. Is it loaded? Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, KSOS, for the opportunity. I do not have any financial interest. That is my uh, disclaimer straight away. So I'll try to conclude fast. We know glaucoma Im is important, right? A silent thief of sight. It's an important, I mean, it's a very difficult task otherwise itself. I'll try to stick to the relevant topic. You know, IOP is important because it is only modifiable risk, uh, modifiable risk factor. We have eye care system. The newer one allows us to measure the IOP even in the supine position. That is one thing important. We have home, uh, home eye care. So it allows you to measure the IOP even at home and record it in an application. And you can send it to your doctor so they can follow up. Now, 24-hour monitoring is a new uh, thing. So you can use a contact lens, which detects the 24-hour uh, IOP, and then it can be recorded. Implantable IOP measurements are also there. In the IOL, you can Im implant that IOP measurement mechanism, and that can be detected. Coming to visual fields, the CETA, we are already familiar. CETA has become faster. 24-2C program is there. A person who has done the CETA normal test uh, multiple times is not doing it properly. Now we have done the 24-2 C, CETA faster. C, uh, the time is very less and the false negatives are also very less. Patient was very comfortable. It's a life of virtual reality now. It is the life of virtual perimetry also. Just a headgear, an iPad, a clickable button. Many patients can do, no dark room required. Anywhere you can do. Similar visual field output. E easily understandable. You can take anywhere you go. Keep it in a bag, go, do it. And a printable report, which can be easily understandable by anybody. A has come to disk assessment also. Take your phone with an AI inside. You don't even need an uh, internet for that. Anybody can do take the photo with a handheld device. What the machine, what the phone does, what the program does, takes the disk and uh, cup disk ratio, identifies the damaged area says whether this patient needs to be referred to a glaucoma specialist or not. Your job is done. Nothing to, uh, with high sensitivity and specificity. Even better than the glaucoma specialist sometimes in identifying the sensitivity. In OCT, what is new? It has uh, identified the vessels. So why is it important? You see how uh, dense is this um, blood vessels here. And in a moderate glaucoma where there is an RNFL defect, you can see the drop of vessels in that area. And uh, in advanced glaucoma, you see what? A complete drop of vessels. So vessels are mapped without dye, without injection, non-invasive, very important. Coming from diagnostics to medications, newer medications are coming up in glaucoma. Fixed dose combinations are coming up. Preservative free medications, sustained release medications. So rho kinase inhibitors are the newer medications that are available to us. The ripasudil, netasudil. Ripasudil is two times. Nepasudil is uh, once daily. Tell the patient you will have redness, irritation. Otherwise, patient will come back telling you that I have put the medication, very much redness, I cannot put that. If you want the patient, patient will not come back with that complaint. But do tell that patient. That is the most important thing. Another thing is like patient can have epithelial edema. Don't get worried. If you stop the medication, immediately that epithelial edema will go off. It, it can be seen on the ASOCT also. We have stopped the medication and the second picture, we can see that the epithelial edema has gone off. Roclatan, which is a combination of prostaglandin and rock, rock inhibitor. Another medication, once daily medication. Over and above prostaglandin, you have additional med IOP drop. Not available in India currently, but this is a medication of importance. Another lat PGA type of medication, because of dual mechanism of action, additional drop in pressure. 
first triple drug com we are familiar with timolol and uh, other uh, combinations double dose combinations we are com familiar now three medicines comes in single bottle number of medications less easy compliance is increased preservative free compliance is increased because ocular, ocular toxicity is a main challenge a glaucoma specialist faces if you give sustained release medications better because you don't have to put the drops again and again compliance increases glaucoma better treated this is intracameral insertion again compliance is not a problem slt uh, so selective laser trabecular plasty is equal to medications because now it is considered primary therapy itself but the challenge is you have to do a proper gonioscopy you have to have good knowledge of gonioscopy that is the limiting step uh, and comprehensive ophthalmologist cannot do that because the because of the limiting step of gonioscopy if you have direct of uh, slt you don't have to do gonioscopy you can directly give so it becomes a uh, doable for everybody can conclude? thank you thank you dr jayeshwari on behalf of ksos i request dr sujit nair to present a memento to dr samira <laughs> 